Okay, um, let's move on with our uh, last bonding theory for coordination chemistry, with, which is the ligand field theory. Um, so ligand field theory is essentially nothing else but uh, molecular orbital theory um, applied to coordination compounds. And the method uh, that we will be using to construct molecular orbitals is again the symmetry adapted linear uh, combination of atomic orbitals uh, method that we looked at previously. Uh, but the applicable rules are slightly adjusted to optimize the approach for coordination compounds. So um, let us go through these rules step by step. So the first rule is that we determine the point group of the complex and assign the axes. So there's no uh, difference to our previous method. Uh, now the next step is that we determine what are the relevant metal frontier orbitals uh, for bonding. So in a complex, our uh, metal is our central atom orbital, and we need to determine well, what are the valence orbitals that are relevant for bonding. Um, so for, for instance, a transition metal of the force period, that would be the fours, the 4P, and the 3D orbitals. So the third step is that we determine the symmetry types of these uh, metal orbitals. And we'll see that again, we can just determine this by looking at the character table. So next we need to devote our attention to what the ligand. So um, we, um, first select the highest occupied molecular orb that are suitable for pi bonding. Okay. Um, if the ligand is a molecule, now we can only have molecular orbits when the ligand is a molecule. If the ligand is a simple atom um, or, or ion, then we select the highest occupied atomic orbital, which is suitable for sigma bonding. Uh, so when we have molecule as a ligand, of course, that would mean that we first need to construct the molecular orbital diagram for the um, ligand before we can construct the molecular orbital diagram of the entire complex, given that we need to determine what the highest occupied molecular orbital of that ligand is, uh, and if it's suitable for sigma bond. Okay, so now we, after we've done that, we form ligand group orbitals um, and um, determine the symmetry types of these ligand group orbitals. And we do this the same way we have done it um, previously for the more simple molecules like water and ammonia. We first determine the reducible representation for the ligand group orbitals and then the irreducible representations. Um, that will give us the symmetry types of our ligand group orbitals. So the next step is then to combine the metal orbitals and the ligand group orbitals of appropriate symmetries to form molecular orbitals. And after we have done that, we can construct our molecular orbital diagram. Okay. So then, however, we have only considered molecular orbitals uh, that contribute to sigma bonding. And we need to well, think of pi bonding and delta bonding as well. So um, we therefore uh, look back into the molecular orbital diagram of our ligand and see if there are additional um, molecular orbitals that have um, appropriate energy and um, can be overlapped with metal orbitals in pi or sigma fashion respectively. If this is the case, then again, we determine their symmetry types and combine them with the appropriate metal orbitals to form um, additional molecular orbitals. So these molecular orbitals would then be pi molecular orbitals. So now let us apply all these rules uh, to a number of examples. In our first example, short B, an octahedral complex 
of a fourth period um, transition metal. So, um, well, if the complex is octahedral, then the point group will be OH, okay, and the coordinate system is also clearly defined. The three axes will just uh, point toward the uh, different corners, uh, the different vertices in our octahedra. So our next step is then that we need to determine the symmetry of the metal frontier orcas. So if we want to determine the symmetry, we first need to be clear what the metal frontier orbitals actually are. So if we have a fourth period transition metal, then the valence orbitals are, well, the um, 3D orbitals as well as the 4S as well as the 4P. Okay, so we have the 4S. In addition, we have the 3, 4P. And in addition to that, we have our five um, 3D orbits. Now, for all of them, we need to determine the symmetric type. How do we do this? And um, we can simply look at the respective uh, character table and see where the orbitals appear. So now, what about um, the 4S? We have learned that an S orbital is always having uh, a so totally symmetric symmetry type, which is um, the first symmetry type in the character table, which has only characters of one in its associated irreducible representation. To so see that in the point group OH, this is the symmetry type A1G, okay, which is listed first and in which all characters here are plus one. All right, so we can therefore say, well, our force orbital is the symmetry type A1G. So next we can look at the P orbitals. So now uh, you see that in this case, the P orbitals are triply degenerate because you see here X, Y, and Z in parentheses. And the associated symmetry type would then be this one here, which is T1U. So these orbitals would all have T1U symmetry and would be triply degenerate. So last but not least, we need to look at our uh, D orbitals. So you see here the DXY, the DXC, and the DYZ are found here in the character table. You see here the letters XY, XZ, and YZ. You see that they're again in parentheses, that means that they are triple degenerate and the associated symmetry type is this one here. Okay, which is T2G. Okay, we previously also uh, noticed that when we discussed the crystal field theory, we called the DXY, the DXC, and the DYZ of the T2G because they have the symmetry type T2G on the OH. So um, last but not least, we have the 3DX, 3DZ square and the 3DX square minus Y square. So you see them actually here. Okay. We have the X square minus Y square function in this line and we see here, 2z square minus x square minus y square. Um, remember that this is the formula for cone, representing the cone and uh, uh, conical node, our d uh, orbital. Um, so now the name dz square orbital is nothing else but a short form of uh, 2z square minus x square minus y square. So the, this identifies this term here to be representative for this orbital here. And um, you see that the disease square orbital is uh, degenerate with the x square minus y square. So we have here double degeneracy. And the exact symmetry type can be found over here. And that's the EG symmetry type. Okay, so now we are now symmetry types of all of our metal 
uh, for T orbitals, all our metal valence moments. So now what is the next step? The next step is to look at the ligand. Now it depends what the ligand is. So an example, as an example here, we will um, choose a carbon monoxide molecule as the ligand, carbon monoxide as a ligand, it's called a carbon ligand. Uh, it's a very common ligand in coordination compounds. So uh, it's a good example to take. And we have to determine now um, which um, highest occupied molecular orbital um, can be used for sigma bonding with the um, transition metal. And to do this, of course, we first have to construct the molecular orbital diagram of our ligand, uh, which is, as I said before, the carbonyl ligand as an example. So now we have to be clear first about the point group of this um, ligand. And in this case, we have a linear molecule as a ligand. We know that the point group associated with that is C infinite V. So now this point group has a, a rotational axis of highest order, which is of infinite order. And for that reason, um, the point group C infinite V is difficult to work with. However, we can reduce the symmetry to a lower symmetry that will still uh, work for us. And the lowest symmetry that we can choose is the symmetry C4V. Okay? So that means that we actually reduce the order of the uh, infinite principal axis from infinite to four. So why do we choose four? Um, the reason is that when we choose four, we have reduced our symmetry to the maximum in the maximum possible way without overlooking degeneracies. Okay, and that is essentially because. Um, the valence orbitals of both the carbon and the oxygen are S and P orbitals, okay? So now in the CO molecule, well, uh, one type of P orbital, and that's the PZ orbital, um, if we assume that the bond axis is actually Z axis, makes the sigma bonding, and the 2px and the 2py orbital, they stand perpendicular to the bond axis, okay? And their angle between is 90 degrees, okay? So therefore, um, um, we choose um, the C4v symmetry because then we do not overlook the degeneracy of the px and the py orbitals in the molecule because we can, uh, rotate the molecule um, by 90 degrees, thereby interconverting the px and the py orbitals. And remember, um, we said previously that um, two orbitals are degenerate when there is a uh, symmetry operation then that can interconvert them. So therefore, when we choose a C, a C4 axis, our principal axis, then we do not overlook the symmetry, um, uh, sorry, the um, degeneracy of the 2px and the 2y, uh, the 2px and the 2py orbital. Uh, we could have also chosen, for instance, C8v, then we would also not have overlooked that symmetry, but our point group would have a higher symmetry and would still be more complicated to work with. We could not have chosen um, C2. Uh, v as the symmetry because then we will start uh, overlooking the degeneracy of the uh, uh, 2px and the 2py orbitals. Okay, so now um, there is uh, another um, um, aspect to consider. 
So when we previously did symmetry adapted linear combination of atomic orbitals, then our molecule had a central atom and had ligand atoms. Okay, so when we have a diatomic molecule like this, like CO, of course we don't, we cannot really define a central atom. So what do we do in this case? Um, in this case, um, we uh, treat um, every, well, orbital uh, uh, separately um, and define only the uh, symmetry of the ligand orbitals by the same method we have determined the symmetry of our central atom orbits. So now that means that we actually only need to lock into the periodic uh, so into the character table in order to determine the symmetry types of our valence orbits. So for both the carbon and the oxygen, our valence orbitals are the 2s orbitals and the uh, 2p orbitals. So now I see here the point groups C4v. So now for the 2s orbital, we always have the totally symmetric symmetric type. And that's in this point group A1, as you can see, and therefore we can say, well, our 4s orbital has the symmetry type A1. So now what about our PZ, uh, 2PZ orbital? Well, you see that we have here the letter Z in the irreducible representation of the type A1, and that means that our two PZ orbitals of both the carbon and the oxygen will also have the symmetry type A1. So now what about the two PX and the two PY? So now you see that um, both the uh, letters X and Y are here in parentheses, and that indicates that the two PX and the two PY orbitals are degenerate and precisely they have the symmetry types E. Symmetry type E. Yeah. So now we have determined the symmetry type of all our orbitals, and we, in this case, a diatomic linear molecule, and the orbits for a diatomic linear molecule, and we can now construct the molecular orbits by combining atomic orbitals of the same symmetry. So, um, well, we have for our oxygen the 2PS and the 2PYs. And we have for our carbon, the uh, 2s uh, and the, and the sorry, the 2s and the 2ps, not only the 2ps, but the 2ps. So um, the respective symmetry types are A1 for the 2s orbitals, uh, 2pz for the, uh, sorry, A1 for the 2pz orbital and E for the 2PX and the 2PY orbital. So now you see that the uh, 2P orbitals of the oxygen have a lower energy than the 2P orbitals of the carbon. So that is because um, oxygen is further right in the, in the periodic table in comparison to carbon. Because of that, um, the respective orbitals experience a higher effective nuclear charge. Remember that the point from the first chapter. And because of that, the orbital energies are lower. So the same is actually true for the uh, 2s orbital of the oxygen in comparison to the 2s orbital of the carbon. So the effective nuclear charge acting on the 2s orbit of the oxygen is greater than the effective nuclear charge acting on the 2s orbit of the carbon. Therefore, the 2s of the oxygen has a lower energy than the um, 2s of the carbon. Okay, so now we can construct our molecular orbitals by combining um, orbitals of the same symmetry type. So for instance, we can start with the A1 type orbital. So you see <clears throat> there are two over here and two over there. So now how many molecular orbitals would we expect? 
Can anybody answer that question? So when we combine four orbitals, then we are getting four molecular orbitals, okay? So now what would we expect with regards to the energy of these orbitals? We would expect that uh, one is uh, uh, bonding, strongly bonding, one is uh, a strongly enter bonding, um, one is weakly bonding, and one is weakly enter bonding. Okay, and they are um, energy wise ordered respectively. So the strongly bonding one with the lowest energy, then there's the weakly bonding one, weakly enter bonding one with the strongly enter bonding. Okay. So that's the 1A1, we label them the 2A1, the 3A1, the 4A1. And last but not least, we connect all the orbitals with their orbitals of uh, origin by dotted lines. So now what's left is the uh, orbitals of E type. So we have uh, the 2px and the 2py of oxygen, as well as the 2px and the 2py of the carbon. So they give, well, a bonding pair of orbitals, which is doubly degenerate, and another pair of orbitals, which is also doubly degenerate. And that pair of orbitals is enter bonding. And we, again, um, label, these orbitals correctly, so this would be the 1e, and that would be the 2e, and we would combine, I would connect these orbitals using dotted lines. So now what's left to do is to fill the electrons into the orbitals. So now how many electrons do we have available? Well, the carbon is four valence electrons, and the oxygen has six valence electrons, so we have overall 10. And that means that we have to fill the 1A1, so we have two, the 2A1, um, that gives four electrons. Then we fill these two 1E orbitals. Now we have eight electrons. And last but not least, we fill this 3A1 um, <clears throat> orbital here. And now we have 10 electrons. So this makes this orbit here, the highest occupied molecular orbital. And this um, orbital here, or these two, are the lowest unoccupied molecular orbits. So um, this uh, molecular orbital here has been produced through sigma uh, orbital overlap between the S orbitals and the 2PZ orbitals. Therefore, we can conclude from this that this orbital has suitable symmetry to overlap with um, molecular orbitals, also, sorry, uh, frontier orbitals of the metal in sigma fashion. And we can select this highest occupied molecular orbital as the highest occupied molecular orbital suitable for. Um, sigma bonding, and we have now completed um, the first um, step. So um, it is again insightful to compare the MO picture of um, the bonding in our ligand with the um, valence bond picture. So the valence bond, valence bond structure of carbon monoxide would be this. And you know, uh, 
we have a carbon oxygen triple bond as well as well an electron lone pair of the carbon as well as an electron lone pair of the oxygen that gives the oxygen atom a formal positive charge and the carbon atom a formal negative charge okay so now can we explain the bonding electrons as well as the um, electron lone pairs here um, let us see if this works um, you see that we have overall um, um, four um, or oh, sorry um, six electrons which are actually um, strongly bonding so we said that this is strongly bonding molecular orbital so with this molecular orbital we can explain the sigma bond between carbon and oxygen and these two other bonds here would, would, would uh, represent two pi bonds within the molecule and so these four electrons here would be represented by these uh, pi bonding electrons. okay so now what to do with the electron pairs so um, we said that um, this um, orbital here is actually still a weakly bonding orbital but we can actually approximate a weakly bonding orbital as a uh, approximately non-bonding orbital um, and this one here is a weakly interbonding orbital which we can approximate also as an approximate and non-bonding orbital an approximate non-bonding orbital would be consistent with electron pairs okay so now um, because this molecular orbital here isn't energetically uh, uh, somewhat lower, we would assign this orbital here um, mostly to the more electron negative atom, which is the oxygen. And this orbital here, that HOMO, would represent the um, electron on pair at the more electro uh, positive atom and according to that the carbon monoxide molecule would have its reactive end at the carbon atom so this is something which is actually not non-obvious from the valence bond structure of the carbon monoxide molecule actually it's even counterintuitive because the oxygen is actually the more electro negative atom so we would more easily understand why it would bind to a more electropositive metal. However, when we look into the molecular oral diagram, we would understand why the carbon is the reactive end because the energetically higher electron lone pair is associated at the carbon that makes this electron pair more reactive than that electron lone pair. And thus the uh, carbon is the reactive end. However, this is um, just a side aspect uh, and a little bit of an uh, excursion. Um, let us now go back to the main track and go to the uh, next step in our symmetry adapted linear combination of atomic orbitals process to construct the molecular orbital diagram of our octahedral complex. All right. So yeah, just as I said, these can be approximated as non-bonding, which explain the um, electron lone pairs here and here. So one aspect that I did mention is that because of the localization of this orbital here at the at the carbon, surprisingly, the dipole moment of this molecule is polarized slightly toward the carbon. So this is opposite of what we would expect from electronegativity arguments because again the oxygen would be considered to be the more electronegative atom and the carbon the positive atom we would at first glance think well that molecule must be polarized about the oxygen 
but it's actually not true. The um, carbon oxide molecule is slightly polarized toward the carbon. Okay. And that is because only the bonding electrons are mostly located at the oxygen, but in, the interbonding electrons are mostly uh, localized at the carbon. Okay, but now let's really uh, go back to the main track. Um, we have now selected our highest occupied molecular orbitals. So we must in the next step determine their symmetry types and you go through the usual procedure of determining the reducible representation through the orbital swapping method. And then you determine the symmetry types <clears throat> of the irreducible representation using the reduction formula. So there's nothing much to learn here by going through this process um, explicitly again. Therefore, I won't do that process explicitly, but I will only um, present the results of that uh, process. So um, first of all, how many homos do we have and how many uh, ligand group orbits would we expect? If we have an octahedral complex, then we would expect that we would need six homos to be combined to form six ligand group orbits. And uh, what would be now the symmetry types of these six ligand group orbitals? There would be one, um, group order with an A1G symmetry type. Um, there would be two of them that have EG symmetry. And there would be three of them that have T1U symmetry. So um, that one here wouldn't have a node. This one here would, these ones here would have one node and these ones here would have Two nodes, so that would make this one here the lowest energy ligand group of these three here, um, the second highest energy ligand group of this, and the EG ligand group of this would have uh, the highest energy. Okay, so what we can do now in the next step is to um, combine um, metal frontier of with ligand group orbitals that have the same symmetry type in order to construct the molecular orbital diagram of our complex considering sigma bonding. And thus far sigma bonding only later on we still need to find the molecular orbitals for pi bonding as well. So now uh, what we can do is again replace the uh, orbitals of the metal to the left and the orbitals of the ligand uh, to the right. So these would be the six ligand group orbitals. So now what would this be? So for the metal, that would be the 3D orbitals, the 4S and the 4P, and we would have to write them according to energy. So on the right side, well, we would have our six homos of the ligand um, as the uh, orbitals that we have combined to form six ligand group orbits. Uh, we can, it's okay to write them all the same in energy. You could also slightly differentiate the energies according to the number of the nodes they have. Both of uh, both methods would be acceptable. This is the somewhat more simpler uh, form here. So in the next step, we would need to assign the symmetry types. So we said previously, the symmetry types for the metal D orbitals are EG and T2G respectively. For the 4S, we have A1G symmetry. And for the 4P orbitals, we have T1U symmetry. So for the ligand group orbitals, we determined that one of them has A1G symmetry, Two of them have EG symmetry and three of them have T1U symmetry. 
So what we need to do now is combine orbitals that have the same symmetry type to form molecular orbitals. So now we can, for instance, start with the orbitals that have A1G symmetry types. See that there's the 4S on the left side and one ligand group all of the, on the right side. So that gives how many molecular orbitals? Well, it will give two molecular orbitals. So one of these orbitals would be bonding and the other one would be interbonding. The bonding one would be called the 1A1G and the interbonding one would be called the 2A1G. All right, um, so what could we combine next? We could combine next for instance, the EG orbital. So we see that we have two EG orbitals um, on the left side, and we have two EG orbitals on the right side. So what will that give? Well, that will give four orbitals overall, and two of these orbitals uh, will be bonding and doubly generate, and there will be two other orbitals that are high in energy and will be um, interbonding in double degenerate as well. So you see that, um, the bonding ones here, um, they're called the one, EG orbitals at the interbondings over there, which are called the two EG orbitals. So again, um, we connect the bonding molecular orbitals with the appropriate um, orbitals from which they have been constructed, in this case, the EG orbitals over here and over here it's better. Okay, now what is left? Well, what's left is the um, T1U. You see, we have three of them on the left side, the four P orbitals of the method of T1U symmetry. And there are three others of, on the right side. So there are also uh, three ligand group orbitals that have T1U symmetry. So what will that give? So that will give T1U type um, molecular orbitals. So that will give three bonding ones that are triple degenerate and have the point of T1U. It will give three interbonding ones which are also triple degenerate and have so T1U, this one would be called the 1T1U, I forgot the one here, and that one would be called the 2T1U. Okay, so again, we would connect the bonding and the interbonding T1Us with the T1Us from which they have originated. So this would be these ones here and three of these six. So now with everything done, and we see not quite because we still have the 3D orbitals, which we have, which have T2G symmetry. So now you see that these T2G orbitals do not find a bonding partner because we do not have any ligand group orbital which has that symmetry type. So therefore, we need to write these orbitals non bonding into the molecular orbit diagram. Okay, so now what about the electrons? So we consider our bond, um, a, a dative bond uh, to form the sigma bond. So that means that all bonding um, electrons come from the ligand and that all ligand orbitals are being full, okay? Therefore, we consider well, all the homos of the CO to be full with electrons. And so we have overall 12 electrons available, okay? So it would fill these 12 electrons into six molecular orbitals that have the um, lowest energy. So that would fill this, 1A1G, it would fill the three T1U bonding orbitals here, so that would be eight. And finally, it would um, 
fill these two bonding 1 EG orbits. So any metal orbital, um, sorry, any metal D electrons okay, that we would have in the metal would need to go into the T2G and the two EG orbitals here, okay, which are non-bonding and uh, somewhat um, interbonding respectively. Okay. So we therefore can say that these um, orbitals here are, well, the metal D orbitals that um, are in a octahedral ligand field. Okay. So these uh, T2G orbitals are really metal D orbitals because these are the non-bonding DXY, DXZ, and the DYZ. So these ones will certainly also have an influence from the EG uh, ligand group orbitals. But you see that um, they're energetically located um, uh, close to the metal EG orbitals, and therefore we can also expect that they are localized mostly at the metals. So we can therefore say, well, these um, two EG molecular orbitals are the metal D orbitals in the in an octahedral ligand field. Okay, so if we had D electrons, we would therefore fill these D electrons into the T2G and the EG orbit, depending on how many D electrons that we have. So now you see, um, there's a nice analogy between the ligand field theory and the crystal field theory. So in a crystal field theory, we said that, well, um, our uh, metal D orbitals split in energy into T2G and EG orbitals in an octahedral crystal field. And and in analogy, in the ligand field theory, our metal D orbitals split into T2G orbitals and uh, EG orbitals in an uh, octahedral, octahedral ligand field. That, in a way, um, also explains why the crystal field theory works as a bonding theory, even though it's not a bonding theory uh, by uh, design, okay? It's just um, that in the crystal field theory, we are only looking at what happens to the metal D orbits, while in the ligand field theory, we have a more comprehensive um, approach to the bonding uh, in, the, in the complex. Okay, um, now thus far, we have considered only um, sigma bonding. Oh, oh yeah, so I forgot one thing. So an analogy to the crystal field theory, we can now call the difference between these T2G and these EG molecular orbitals, the delta uh, O. And um, we can explain the um, both the magnetic properties as well as the optical properties depending uh, on how large that delta O is. Okay. So we also see that we can actually explain the six bonds in our octahedral coordination compound, okay, because we see that um, we have six electron pairs in six um, bonding molecular orbits. So you also see that we have no other, no electron, which is not in a bonding molecular orbital. So all our bonding molecular orbitals are filled, all the other molecular orbitals are being empty. In this way, we would also understand why such a complex would be, would be stable. Uh, so from that, you can see that um, the ligand field theory can explain both the number of bonds. It can explain the octahedral shape. It can also explain magnetism and it can explain optical spectra through uh, uh, the size of the, in spectral chemical series, through the size of the delta O, similar to the crystal field theory. Okay, so now we should consider though, that thus far, 
we have only considered the sigma bonding. We have not even considered um, possible pi and delta bonding yet. So this uh, will now further refine our molecular orbit diagram. So in the next step, we therefore must think about, well, does our ligand have uh, uh, molecular orbitals that from the standpoint of symmetry as well as the standpoint of energy could interact in pi fashion with our metal uh, orbitals? So now we need to go back and look into the molecular orbit diagram of the ligand. So we said previously that this year, the 3A1 was our highest of the pi molecular orbital. So now we see that we have these bonding pi orbitals of E1 type, which are energetically not much higher than the HOMO. So these would have suitable symmetry to overlap with metal D orbitals in a pi fashion and would be energetically not too low. So in addition to that, we have these uh, 2E um, pi star orbitals. So they would also have suitable symmetry um, uh, to overlap with metal D of the pi fashion, and they would be energetically not too high. Therefore, we can um, select these two, uh, one E1 and these two, two E1 molecular orbitals for pi bonding with metal D orbitals. So how would the exact um, orbital overlap actually take place? Okay, um, that's on the next slide. Um, for that, um, we can just see here how many orbits we overall have, overall have to consider. So per ligand, we would have two pi bonding pi orbitals to consider and two interbonding ones. So that's four. So now we have six ligands. So that would be six times four, which could, would overall give 24 molecular, uh, 24 molecular orbits to consider. Okay, 12 would be bonding ones and 12 would be interbonding ones. All right, but now to the question, how do these overall orbitals overlap? Um, so you see here a bonding pi orbital of the ligand. So that can overlap in a pi fashion with the metal D orbital. So in the X, if that is the XZ plane, that would be the DXZ orbital. So in addition, um, we would have the pi star of the orbital, which have this shape. <coughs> so if that's again the um, XC plane, then we would have here um, the, here the DXZ orbital that would be over that would overlap with this um, pi star orbital also in pi fashion. Okay. So now, of course, the same also uh, is true for the other bonding pi orbital, okay? which would now be in the YZ plane. So that orbital would overlap in a pi fashion to the DYZ orbital, as you can see here. And of course, that's not only possible with the bonding pi orbital here, same is also true for the pi star orbital. Okay, you see that Pastable has one additional node, but that doesn't hinder it to overlap with the metal DYZ orbital um, in a pi fashion. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, there are also the five other ligands to consider. Um, and, well, one is approaching on the z-axis and the other four are approaching on the x and the, and the, and the y-axis, but they would also lead to pi orbit overlap and that pi orbital overlap would uh, be possible for both pi and the pi star orbit that would overlap with the dxc and the dyz as well as the dxy orbitals, respectively. All right, um, so now we would have to determine 
again, the symmetry types of these um, 24 um, ligand uh, orbitals. And we can do that determination separately for the 12 bonding pi and the 12 interbonding pi orbitals. So for the 12 pi bonding orbitals, we would find that they have T1G, T2G, T1U, and T2U symmetry. And for the 12 interbonding orbitals, we would find the same. Okay. So four of them would have so three of them would have T1G symmetry, three of them would have T2G symmetry, three of them would have TU symmetry, and three of them would be would have T2U symmetry, and four times three that gives um, also well. So finally, I wanted to mention that uh, not only uh, pi orbitals can overlap with metal D orbit in the pi fashion. There are also other orbitals that you can do that. So for instance, when you have a simple bromo ligand, um, some of the P orbitals of the bromo ligand will be oriented correctly um, to overlap with the metal D orbital in a phi, pi fashion. So that could be either the DYZ, the DXZ, or the DXY. Um, when you have a metal, metal bond, then even another d orbital can overlap with a d orbital in a, in a pi fashion. All right. So with this uh, information in hand, we can now construct the molecular orbital diagram for this octahedral complex under the consideration of pi bonding. But I see we are already two minutes over the time. So therefore, I will stop now. <laughs>